Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Discussing a Murderer, Season 2, Episode 42. Uh, excited for today. We have a full panel. Everybody's here. Made special arrangements just so we could all be here for this kind of end of Episode 9 uh, reenactment portion of of ma'am uh, where there's going to be a lot of comments made it's it's kind of the peak of the series I would say um, and so therefore I'm just extra just happy about having everybody here so why don't we introduce everybody starting at the top and say hello to Jack Jack welcome back nice to see you and good evening thank you thank you and greetings to everyone on the panel and everyone in live chat uh, sorry, I missed uh, last week's scheduling conflicts and all, but uh, hey, it's great to be here today, and I'm ready to roll. Let's do it. Ready to roll on to the next. Big Jeff, nice to see you. Good evening. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. It's really good to have the whole panel in place. I really uh, like it when, ev when everyone's around. I think the discussion that we have gets deeper and deeper uh, You know, when whenever we have the full panel. So I'm really looking forward to that. Hello to everybody in chat. Uh, it's finally warming up in, in New England, and, and summer's getting ready to to, to, to burst. So uh, th things are on the right trajectory, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, Kathleen's reenactment. So let's get to it. Oh, absolutely. I like that attitude, Big Jeff. Let's get to it. Kel, uh, welcome. Good morning. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. It's 6.20 in the morning. It's still pitch black, um, dark, so it's um, still waking up. I agree. It's great to have the whole panel here. Hello to everyone in chat, and let's get it on. Let's get it on. Let's get to it. On to the next. You pick your uh, analogy or preference there, uh, Dr. Silkman. Welcome back to the show, uh, and good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, and I'd like to say hi, a big hi to everyone on the panel. It's great that we're all together, and uh, a big hello to everyone in chat. It's fantastic to be part of this team, and yeah, cannot wait. Thank you, guys. Assuming the Don Flitzke phone call happened at 227, which I believe that it did, Teresa arrived at 147 and Avery Road around 231. One of the things that I learned being out there is the property is so huge compared to what most people think. You have to go at least a quarter of a mile down Avery Road, even to get to Mr. and Mrs. Avery's residence. Then you take a right turn and you go down another long road, probably not quite a quarter of a mile to Stevens trailer and where Barb's trailer was immediately east of it. That, that is the spot where the bus driver let off Brendan Dassey and Blaine Dassey when they went home. Uh, and it's very interesting that at that spot um, where the mailboxes were, uh, according to Tom Sawinski, that's where he delivered the newspapers uh, early in the morning of November the 5th. Well, Dr. Silkman, that's some serious symmetry you just brought to the show here because if you guys can remember way back in episode one of season one, the first thing that we spoke about were these mailboxes. So thanks for closing that loop for us, Dr. Silkman. Uh, we're definitely bringing it all the way back in uh, and to the peak of, of this kind of reenactment. So uh, I think that's just perfect symmetry. Really appreciate that one. So anybody want to go back and look at episode one when we're done, start all the way over from the beginning again. Uh, it'll tie right back in. We think that she arrives on the Avery property at 235. Stephen is starting to initiate a call to her and hangs up without it connecting because he looks out his window and he sees her. So what Stephen has consistently said in his interviews and police reports is that when Teresa arrived, she never comes to the trailer. He walks out to her car 
She gives him the document. He gives her the money, and she drives off. So the money, and then the information from the car. Gave her the $40. She gave you an Auto Trader magazine. I thought it, while we're watching this, we could maybe break down what we know and what we don't, like what they knew back then and what, you know, the other alternatives because – Kathleen just said that we suspect that she came at 2.35. Um, and that's interesting because then we can loop in other things we know about this. So originally, before they, like, um, went back and obviously reviewed as a team, uh, Stephen and Kathleen, with his phone pings, he was provided his phone pings and that is apparently where he says in his uh, supplemental affidavit that that is how he remembered the 235 moment and um, because of the phone call that he tried to make and it didn't go through. But if we back up a little bit, there used to be another timeline before this one. His, Stephen always originally stated that she actually arrived just after the 221 a phone call that he tried to make to her in his original statement up into I think it was 2018 he always maintained he called her at 221 and it didn't it rang out um, and he was ringing her to, again see where she was but he didn't want to put pressure on her then he said she immediately came straight after that and he always assigned the 235 phone call to the fact that she had just left and he went to ring her to call her back but then changed his mind so originally he thought that the 235 was in connection to the call back but I just wanted to bring that in because now they settled with when he reviewed his records that that is the time of her now arrival. So it's just little trivia things like that I thought we could address because it does kind of make sense to bring it in because we do have two different timelines. And why I also bring that up is because of this. It's a butterfly effect. There is still some people that believe that the first narrative could be still, could be still true, could be more accurate. And when she left, he did in fact call her back, which opens up to why she was already pinging in White Law Tower and why she was closer to that because she had already left those few minutes earlier if you go on that timeline narrative. So little things like that. So Dawn alleged at the beginning that she doesn't ever remember. If you go back and read her um, earlier uh, statements. She never ever claimed she even spoke to her, uh, Teresa, at that time. And then as it got closer to trial, all of a sudden she had this epiphany and this remarkable remembrance of this phone call that lasted five minutes and that they talked about life in general and um, Halloween. Uh, and then obviously she also said that uh, she had to squeeze in. This was the real pivotal part for her testimony was um, I asked her if she worked out where she was going and, and she said, Teresa told me I am on my way to the Avery, Avery Savage Brothers. Uh, now, it, the question is, was it a five-minute phone call or was it a voicemail? Like, it, again, I don't know. This is what's always been up in air with the community what do we we don't know and I don't think it can be quite proven the other thing that I just want to point out with a lot of people that have done a lot of research in terms of auto trader phone calls and Dawn and Teresa what they can find on the records never in the history of her records show that she ever spoke to any of them for five minutes Gave her the 40 bucks. She gave you an auto trader magazine. Yeah. Okay, and then she oh, was there. She went, oh, she went to the car and got me there. Now, you said you were inside your home when she pulled up. Yeah. Okay. And the contact you had with her only lasted for how many minutes? Within five minutes. And then from after you're done with her and she gives you the book, where do you go to? I go back in the house. Okay. And how long are you there for? Probably, I don't know, drop off the book. Then I walked over by Barbara. 
By where? By Barbara, my sister. Okay. I said Bobby was home, but Bobby was already gone. He just left. So she leaves. You put the Auto Trader magazine in your house. Yeah, and I went over there. And you walked right over right away? Well, he was gone. He just left. Bobby did? Yeah. Did you see him leave? No. So he was already gone. Yeah, he just left. He, what, what, did he drive somewhere? Or yeah. Some, what did he drive? Yeah, he took his blazer. Do you know where he went? No. Okay, let's go back to the van. Good. So the money and then information for the car. Then, Perfect. How do you get to the point of going from the van where she's taking a picture to her vehicle for the book? A walk. You, you ask her for a book? No, she said I, I got the book in the truck. Okay. So then you follow her towards the truck. Yeah. What happens next? No, she opened the door. She got in. Then she reached over. She sat down inside? Yeah. She reaches over to where to get the book? Yeah. No, pass her side. And then she just handed it out to you? Yeah. Does she, then she, does she get back out of the truck again? No, no. And she just leaves? No. Is, is Bobby home then or no? Yeah, Bobby's home. Okay. And does he come out or anything, or does he see you leave or see her leave? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. But you know he's home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he's home she, at that point. When she leaves, he's home? Yeah. <laughs> Was it a normal occurrence for Teresa Hobart to give a copy of an Auto Trader magazine to the clients that she has seen? And I think it is, reason, My understanding is he did have the latest copy of Auto Trader magazine in his, uh, next to his computer. And I believe that uh, Joylene Zipperer also had a copy of the Auto Trader magazine because clearly right. Teresa Hobart had gone there. So... I just want to put out there that Stephen is not lying or fabricating at that point. And I'd like to add to that because I was thinking something similar, but I was wondering to myself, you know, because he made a point of where did she get the magazine from, basically. And, you know, well, she she leaned over. Basically, she had him in the, I'm guessing, the passenger, front passenger side uh, seat. So how many copies did she basically take with her when she went out, you know, to do to take photos? And where did she get them? Were this were these complimentary copies that Auto Trader mailed her? Because I've never heard anyone say I've never investigated it, but it's a question that... I've always wondered about too. Because you'd think they probably have them hanging out at the office or somewhere. She probably grabs a handful, chucks them on the passenger seat, make sure she has them, and give out. Where are the, where are the other ones? Right? So yeah, exactly. She, she didn't take exactly enough, right? Because she wants to have extra of those because she. Made an appointment. Steve Schmitz was wondering where she was, right? She, she, That's uh, right. yep. So I come back and he was gone. So, just in that moment of yeah. you saying goodbye to Teresa, yeah. going to your house. house with the paper and coming back, you notice that he's gone. Yeah. But while she's giving you that thing, he's still there. Yeah. So he, okay. Within, I don't know, that second. I'm just going to bring it up now because we're doing the timeline of this. Um, I know there's one part in this entire, um, you know, this reenactment and in terms of the general uh, community that, you know, a lot of people get hung up on. Um, and I guess it's a fair for them to question it because, you know, I think he, uh, Bobby even brings it up in the trial uh, where he says that he um, he was obviously, and I'm, I'm only addressing it now because we're, kind of just cover that part I don't want it to get a bit further down this reenactment and then bring it up because it, it won't mash well uh so he's saying he's standing he's obviously seeing her through the window and it's this moment where he says I saw her walk towards Stephen Avery's trailer now he never says I saw her enter he never puts them two together. He just says that when I, the last time I basically saw her, she was walking towards the trailer. Now, Ken Karatz is, uses that and in a manipulative way in, in the trial and latches onto that and implants to the jury, you know, creates that, oh, you know, he expands it basically. But that's as far as Bobby goes in terms of what he remembers that she was walking a lot. And I guess the reason why I'm bringing it up is because a lot of people think that that's full of shit. 
there's no way, you know, that she was probably walking towards his trailer. The only thing I do want to address is um, Stephen Avery actually admits that very early on that this was what happened. If you go back to his, I've got it up now, his 2016 affidavit, it's all the way up until he changes, uh, he creates a supplemental one where he goes and reassesses the timeline and that's when some changes get made um, based on, phone records and stuff but um in point 12 of this affidavit i'll read it as follows miss Hallbuck got to our property at 2 31 p.m when i looked out the wind when i looked out of the window of my trailer i saw her taking a picture of my sister's van i put on my shoes to go outside and pay her i saw her start to walk towards my trailer so very early on, he also claims what Bobby was claiming at that time. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, anyone's lying here. I'm just saying that this is what we call the sliding door moments where from one angle and one person's perspective, they're seeing one side of it and the other person is seeing, seeing another side of it. So at this point, it could be absolutely true that both these gentlemen are telling the truth because Bobby doesn't see Stephen eventually walk out to the patio to greet her. He only sees that first part where Stephen is only from his point of view is seeing that moment where he's preparing to walk out to her, but she has already started making that way. So I, I want to address that because I think it's fair um, to both the gentlemen, because this is both in, you know, it's in, it's in an affidavit form. Um, and then obviously when you get back to his supplemental, unfortunately that entire part gets dropped. It never gets written again, but it was always there to begin with. So I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's fair because it was part of his original statement. Um, it's, it's quite clear that both Bobby and, um, uh... Stephen Avery saw exactly the same thing. That is, Teresa um, come up with her car, get out of her vehicle and take uh, photographs of Bob Yonder's van. Um, both individuals, both um, Stephen and both Bobby, describe essentially the same thing. Uh, the, only, uh, the only critical point here is um, the sliding door moment. It's because Stephen was inside his trailer, obviously getting his shoes on and whatever, getting ready to uh, encounter Teresa and pay her, um, I see no issue with that. Um, and that that's why um, what Bobby Dassey witnessed in terms of seeing Teresa walk towards the trailer was very cleverly used by Kratz to insinuate that Teresa Horbach had actually gone inside the trailer. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think... Your, your point that is really the nefarious action here is I think Kratz trying to ascribe this uh, step or two she might have taken towards Stephen as, so, as something uh, nefarious. In my mind, I've always kind of thought that um, any reason that Teresa might have taken a couple steps towards the house was because that happened to be the time where Stephen Avery stepped out of the door and was walking down towards her. And when somebody's doing that, you tend not to just you know stand there like a goon and let them come to you. You tend to take a few steps to greet them. That's sort of the, the social, the social thing to do. Um, and obviously, uh, from Bobby's perspective, Teresa sort of stepped out of frame, if you will. Let me use uh, some some of my film school knowledge that I learned from Jeff Jones. <laughs> she stepped out of the frame from the perspective of the of the window, but there's no idea where she's going, um, you know, uh, or how far she went. I think she just probably took a couple steps up to uh, greet Stephen, who was on the way down. And he, when she went out of the frame, he turned around. Um, and uh, you know, the 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 stories the stories align, and and both people are telling the truth. I, I don't, and I think there's multiple ways um, to reconcile, uh, you know, this these two stories and such that both are telling the truth. Okay. okay. Within, I don't know, that second, uh, he probably at the same time almost. Okay, so but the time that it took you to walk from her vehicle to your place to drop out that thing, yeah. and then to walk right back outside again, yeah. he's gone. He's gone. Okay. He looks and he sees 
that Bobby's truck is in. We, we essentially have two events here. Um, Stephen seeing um, uh, Bobby Dassey's uh, blazer and then not seeing Bobby Dassey, Dassey's blazer. So something occurred by the time he went out, went back in, and went back out. And you know what? If Stephen is just out by a few, maybe 20 or 30 seconds, it can change the entire perspective of everything. And the problem is, is that the state are trying to insinuate something very nefarious, and that is that Teresa Horbach was in actual fact inside Stephen Avery's trailer, right? So we've got a critical event, and I'm sure Kelly and, and everybody also talk about it, the transition of Bobby's blazer being present and then Bobby Daz's, da Dassey's blazer being absent. It, it is crucial because where we're at now as well, because I think a lot of people are, are resting upon the whole, uh, you know, the Brian aspect of it as well with this whole ask my brother, you know, he saw her leave. Um, you know, we, we've got that into play as well now in terms of the narrative. So it's, it's not just become um, who left first, Bobby or Teresa. It's also, you know, the, the alleged, well, Bobby might – Bobby did leave last because he saw her leave. So what way does what way do you kind of want it? And and then for the defense, what way is more um strategic in terms of creating a Denny? Do you want her, do you want Teresa to have gone first and Bobby to be after chasing her down? Or do you want Teresa to have gone first? Bobby hanging around a little bit longer to be basically Stephen's alibi to say, yeah, I comfortably saw her leave the property and then I left. There's another sliding door separation there in terms of um, timeline and events. If it only takes at least 30 odd seconds out, one way forward, one way back. If you're out it can create a complete different timeline unless you are absolutely adamant what is going on and your your record keeping with the time it's only going to be natural that you're just you're going off you know assumption that it was almost immediately i, I just want to say that the one thing that i i find really frustrating in terms of just someone that's just observing all this and trying to soak in all the information because I think that this is the sliding door moments where the details do matter in a sense here. I want to, if I was law enforcement, there's one question that I feel that they fell flat on. And this isn't to put Stephen in a tight spot, but more of a justification for Stephen. And that is, I would have asked, what were you going to Bobby's for? You knew he, like, why would you be going there if you knew he was just come off from night shift and he was asleep? If you thought he was asleep, why would you be going there? And, and I, I, the reason why I kind of wanted, I would want to ask him that is because it'd be interesting if, if Stephen would have turned around and went, well, it's 2.30 in the afternoon. He regularly gets up at this time because he goes hunting. It just gives a little bit more foundation to the activities on and clarification of people's timelines and what they, they state is their true facts. Um, although it doesn't change anything now, it's just still something that always has bugged me like, I wonder why he was going over to see Bobby. Like, you know, he, he makes that part of his narrative so quickly, but no one asked him why. And I just feel that it's actually on law enforcement that they they dropped the ball there. Like, that's a significant detail that you'd want him to put on record in case, you know, you want to not perjure him later but address again to see if anything changes. And it's one thing they don't ask. And there... And then he looks out to the road and Teresa's making a left turn on 147. She was actually exiting the Avery property at around 238. What he didn't realize and we didn't realize was that Bobby's actually about, probably about 
150 yards behind Teresa. But Bobby is in the part of the road that dips down where you can't even see the top of his truck. You know, I don't have a ton to say on this timeline part, but in my mind, I just want to add in this part right here myself, and that is uh, whether Bobby left before or after Teresa Halbach was a couple minutes before, 30 seconds after, something in that zone, whether Kathleen Zellner's timeline is exactly correct or not, they're both on the road at about the same time. It's it, That part is undeniable. And I think that, for me, that's my takeaway. Maybe this isn't what happened. Maybe Bobby went right and she went left. But they were both about that same time when you when you stitch this together from everybody's stories, that's what we get. I can't say if he followed her or not. Was he in front of her or was he behind her? I don't think anybody knows. You know, if, if, if you assume for a second uh, that, that Bobby had nefarious motives and it's not an accusation, um, but just a supposition, uh, assuming that it, it, it doesn't, for, for the rest of this narrative to be true, it could be true irrespective of whether he left first or second, for example, uh, you know, if, if he left before her, he could have idled down by the mailboxes, down by the front, uh, you know, where the uh, the main building is for the for the auto salvage for her to go because he knew she was leaving imminent. imminent. Um, so leaving, you know, the immediate household before her was, you know, not necessarily detrimental to this narrative if he had, you know, some some malintentions. So I 100% agree. Um, that whether he whether he left before her or after her, the rest of this could be could be true uh, and doesn't really damage the narrative. So. For we know, Bobby could have stopped, uh, as Big Jeff said, at the main office, right? Could have checked around, made, see if his uncle was there or whatever. He could have stopped prior to going out. We do not know. But Kathleen Zellner is working with the narrative that both Bobby and Teresa Horbach are close to each other. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, I totally agree with you. I always considered that could have been true. It, and it changes nothing. Bobby could have absolutely left first. In fact, it probably would have been a better narrative in terms of um, reconstruction if he did. And he was waiting for her at the end of the drive, at the uh, Avery Savage driveway, turning into 147. Because when you what well, what we're about to watch, he's now going to be chasing her just to try to catch up with her for several minutes on the road. Where if he had left first, he was already there, and you've just cut the the like time frame down by three minutes, where it's it's a lot easier to you know wave down someone when you're at when she's got to make a stop to make a decision to turn left or right, and you could be there going, hey, help me, my such and such. You know what I mean? Like it, to me, it's more. To me, that narrative makes more sense than spending an extra five minutes on the road in this murdering frenzy that you have this, you know, obsession that today's the day that you're going to do it and you've got five minutes to basically talk your way out of it and turn around, but you keep going. Um, but in saying that, she's work like you got, you just summed it up perfectly, she, she's working off the narrative that she's been presented, that her client says that in his point of view, Bobby left last. So she's working off that, which makes complete sense. Um, the other thing that I just want to say is in terms of, I agree with uh, Jeff Jones, it, it does put them both on the road together around the same time. Absolutely. But then we then have to look at the pings. We have Teresa pinging near Whitelaw Tower, or my apology, off Whitelaw Tower, um, approximately minutes later and then um, we have Bobby who doesn't ping onto Whitelaw Tower but pings in an in a area that could be in the same ratio part but that's 20 minutes later. So in, in a sense, although they're on the road together, their pings and their activity seems to be a 20-minute gap as well. Yeah, just be just be careful of the fact that Bobby didn't have the same uh, cellular plan as Teresa. So uh, the cellular company that he was contracted to m might not have even had a, a radio head on the White, uh, White Lock Tower. Yeah, we that's don't, we don't, exactly we don't right. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but there's but the still a 20-minute gap. Yeah. 
right. Yeah, that's right. Th there's still 20 minutes between the, the pinging. And there's 20 minutes before or 20 minutes after? A bobby comes in 20 minutes after. And how, and yeah, and so you, it's just like you don't know. It's like there's, correct me if I'm wrong, Big Jeff, it's just, it'd be impossible to know, right? Exactly the position of anybody at oh, that point. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You, you're not, you're not going to know unless somebody's under active surveillance uh, exactly where they are under, the, under a tower. You can perhaps put them in the vicinity of the sector that's been identified, but you'd also have to add in some buffer around that area um, just, be, just because of the you know, overall uncertainty of the, of the, of the cellular system. Um, you know, typically, your, your, your signal from the tower that you're uh, attached to has to get low enough before you begin your connection <clears throat> you know, to the next tower or the, or the next sector which could put you into the next sector, right? So it just, uh, you, you have, to have, have to add some uncertainty there. But yeah, so I'm just trying to parse what Kel said for a minute. Um, so what Kel said for 20, 20 minutes, I mean, that's, that's, kind of a, that, that's kind of a long time. If, if Bobby didn't really leave until 20 minutes after, um, you, know, uh, you know, sort of Teresa, let's, let's assume for a second that Teresa was at uh, Stevens. I mean, isn't, isn't he going to hear screaming and yelling as he walks out to his car 20 minutes later? Oh. <clears throat> this, is, this is what Bobby Dassey said during the Stephen Avery trial. He said, I quote, she started before I got in the shower, she actually started walking over to Stephen's trailer. So do you see the disconnect here? He only caught sight of her walking towards Stephen's trailer. And according to what Bobby said in, in Stephen Avery's trial, he then got in the shower. So how, how, does, how does one work this one out? So he only caught sight of her and he, allegedly he then took a shower. So therefore, um, I think the next thing he said that was when he actually left to go bow hunting, um, he noticed that uh, Teresa's vehicle was still there. So could it possibly be that either Bobby is mistaken with his timeline in terms of taking the shower, or is it possible that Stephen actually stayed in his trailer a lot longer than what he said he did before going to Bobby's? We've always said that, you know, because a lot of them have changed their narrative or their timelines even by a few minutes or they've added some extra detail or sometimes removed some certain detail, I went back to Bobby's original um, timeline, his very first, and he actually wrote it himself and signed it in his own handwriting. It's so funny. And this is where I honestly believe that law enforcement had a part in this. He actually put the shower first. He maintained at the very beginning in his own handwriting testimony that he signed that he got up, he had a shower, he got out of the shower and then noticed her arrive as he was getting dressed and looked out the window. Then all of a sudden, and then his next interview on the 9th, it then, for some reason, it then becomes, the no, um, it then becomes... Um, Dietring asks him because you can hear it. Um, and you you had the shower after when she got there, and he just went, "Yeah." It's almost like he had. It's not that he had forgotten. He had just that there was like this moment where Dietring had shifted the timeline to, you know, gaslit Bobby to say that the the shower was occurring after she arrived, but he had already signed in his own handwriting that that event actually was the very first thing he did when he got up shower first and then events that followed and then if you listen to his 2000 and uh what is it 17 or 19 17 um interview again uh in terms of you know that he says everything up to that point i had a quick shower it was only a few minutes when i got out and exactly what dr stookman said he never ever ever says he saw any encounter with Stephen and Teresa. but what he does say is I wasn't even paying attention. I grabbed my stuff. I got out. I got into my car. I drove off. 
I wasn't looking around my surroundings. I wasn't paying attention to see what they were doing. I just left. Um, where Ken Karatz had built this narrative that she was inside this trailer at this point where Bobby's now saying, hey, listen, she could have been sitting in a car because I wasn't even paying attention. The, what, what is disturbing here? It's that it's law enforcement that's driving the narrative, not not the two actual participants who saw Teresa Horbach that day, Bobby and Stephen. And if they can mal if they can manipulate Bobby in terms of him changing his statement when he took the shower, when he saw Teresa Horbach, hey, we're talking about a potential of plus or minus five minutes here, and that is crucial because remember the look on Ken Kratz's face when Bobby Dassey said what time he left and hence why it was so crucial for Bobby to get an alibi from Scott Tadich and Scott Tadich alibied Bobby and Bobby alibied Scott Tadich because I tell you what, if Bobby didn't have that alibi, he was in a lot of hot water. You have to admit he was in a lot of hot water because Stephen is saying, hey, I saw her leave. And he also said, when I went out, Bobby's blazer was gone. You think about the November 9th interview with uh, Bobby. Uh, you know, we finally were able to hear. Um, and some other, you know, we don't really know. Uh, let's just be straight here. We don't really know. But clearly, um, I say clearly, possibly that there's some clarity here in what was said to Bobby. Look, you were there. Stephen was there. One of you is screwed. So what's it going to be? Was it put that that simply to him? I'm just throwing this out here because uh, he is a, a really good Denny uh, in, in this aspect because he he is admittedly there when she's there. Now, he's not the only one on the property, clearly. Uh, Earl was there. Uh, Chuck was there somewhere. You know, uh, at the same time, he's tied really close to her. He admitted to seeing her. So then we get into this really weird November 9th interview, and I don't any I don't know any other way to describe it. Doc, we we've had a really you know we've had many conversations about this. I know others have listened to it as well. It is a really uh, I think over the top interview that. Uh, Dettering, and uh, I can't think of the DCI agent's name that was there. And they were going on and on about, you know, they wouldn't risk their careers. These other people wouldn't risk their careers. Well, maybe it was a maybe, shocking maybe interview. Shocking it interview. Was. It really was. And, you know, um, I just have to wonder what was said to him. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying they did, but at, at the same time, I'm not dancing around the, the fact that I feel strongly that there were elements within the government of an authority of Wisconsin that were going that were going to end those depositions and rejail Avery, no matter what. It was going to happen. He was screwed. That's all I got. I just wanted to throw that in there and, and shake and shake the bottle up real hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, I, I, I mean, when it comes to 1985, that, that it all goes back to 1985. There's, there's no there's no doubt about it. Um, and the, the police have their ways of influencing, you know, as we heard with with poor Brendan, um, you know, they, um, you know, they, they 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 know what they know what they have to say to get people to form the narrative that they that they want to hear or, or or that or that they prefer. That's and, right. and you I, I think maybe you'll remember better than me, Jack. It's either in the Chuck interview, in an interview with Chuck or an interview with Earl, where the police say, oh, you know, we're thinking this was a two man job. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as if to imply, just because we have Stephen, uh, just because we're going to put Stephen in jail today. I, mean, I think it might have been with Earl Avery because because Chuck Avery didn't, didn't talk. Uh, I think they say it. I think they say to him, oh, yeah, Stephen's not going home today. He's under arrest. And later on in the interview, they say um, we, we were thinking this was a two man job. And, you know, of course, that, that's something that is, uh, you know, I don't want to say a direct threat, but it's, it's certainly an intimation that we're looking for another suspect and we're looking at you right now. Um, and you can kind of see them using the, those kind of tactics against, uh, you know, a different teenage boy, Bobby Dassey. If they want to try and alter his narrative, 
um, you know, say something like that. Oh yeah, we're pretty sure this was a two man job, you know, insinuating, were you that, were you that other man? And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe in, you know, the shower, are you sure you took that shower? Oh, you know what? Now that I think about it. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds better to us. And drop all, you know, you know, drop all insinuation of the second, right? They just, they have their ways of doing it. They can do it if they want. Um, and uh, when you're a teenager sitting there uh, and two cops are staring you down and, you know, somebody has been murdered, uh, you're, you're going to, you know, so I think Bobby is, has a, is a person of reasonable intelligence. I think he's a, Kel said he's an honor student, right? He's more than reasonable intelligence. Um, and uh, you, you're, you're going to, you're going to take the cue that's given to you, especially if you're a teenager sitting there sweating. So I, I think that's an easy ask for a cop to get that to change. What, what did they know that they really wanted it at that time? Would be the, you know, sort of the real question. Right. And, you know, speaking of Earl, I, I think it was Earl's interview. But speaking of that, it's funny that you bring that up because there's a great deal of his interview that was redacted and they will not turn over. They will not give me an unredacted copy. They refused twice. Well, the, it is very, that's a very interesting point um, that you guys make because there's no doubt that both Earl and Chuck uh, had veil threats thrown their way. There's no question about it. Um, and, I remember Skolinski, remember Skolinski, especially him. He was trying to convince both brothers that uh, Stephen was guilty of this, no problems at all, we found this, we found that. They were trying to convince uh, both Chuck and Earl that uh, their brother had indeed murdered Teresa Horbach. And um, just another point, it's very interesting that there was a, a news report in which Kratz stated that he wasn't sure whether this was a one or two person job. In other words, he couldn't rule out uh, a second um, potential suspect was involved in the murder. And that's very interesting, isn't it? Because uh, Deidring, the crap that he's right, Jack 61, the crap that he threw at Bobby Dassey, oh, we're the police, I'm nearly reaching retirement age, we wouldn't do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Isn't your job simply to take Bobby Dassey to the hospital and ensure <laughs> that he has a blood test and photos taken? What the hell are you pouring your heart out to this um, young man? It's absolute garbage. Well, well, not only that, they knew from day one that Brendan was over there. He was freely admitted that he was, that they, you know, cleaned up the yard, cleaned up the garage. And at that point, they don't go after him. They don't really go after him. And even Kratz making the statements you just said that they, they could have been a, a second person, but they don't move any anything towards Brendan at all. No, that's a, no. That's, Brendan, a real, that's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. Brendan Wait. doesn't come into the equation um, because we know uh, what, what law enforcement absolutely know for sure is that Teresa Horbach was only seen by two people entering that property. As far as I'm aware, no one has come forward to say, oh, yeah, 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 I saw Teresa drive in. I know there's the propane tank driver, uh, John LeQuern, who says he saw a, a vehicle look very much like Teresa Horbach's RAV4 drive out when he was filling up his uh, uh, propane tank. Um, so that's very interesting. But the only two people that can absolutely state that they saw Teresa arrive, get out of her vehicle and take photographs, Bobby Dassey and Stephen Avery. I just want to, I know this sounds a bit cheeky, but I just want to address it because you guys kind of threw it in there. Um, the 9-11 uh, interview, um, the one where, uh, uh, sorry, it's 11-9 for you guys. I'm doing it Australia way here, uh, where he we finally got that tape that you were talking about, Jay Jacks. Uh, I find it interesting when you listen to it where at the end um, Bobby's actually has a moment where, and I'm sorry if you guys just said this and I just missed it, but where he says he thinks that law enforcement are responsible for the planting. And yep. then Deidre goes into like a 15-minute spill on how loyal they are and stuff that like triggered him hard, yet yeah, that's, that's not the in the report. That's the one. Yeah, he one. actually says, I think, and he's like, who? And he's like, manner to walk. And then Dietrich just has like this meltdown, like, 
we're honest people. Like, do you really think there's evidence? And and we're hard workers. And you think the the reason why I bring that up, it just it just interests me because I get what Kathleen's doing, and I, I do respect it. She's she's doing the best she can with what she's got, especially when we are all in agreement that this whole entire case is being smoke and mirrored by what law enforcement wanted us to see and what direction they wanted people to take. So she's very limited in that aspect because she hasn't had the you know opportunity to do further testing independently on things that we want and obtain new stuff. So she can only go on that. So I get that. But when you hear Bobby sit there and say he thinks it was law enforcement that planted that is really in contrast to this whole narrative that Bobby had apparently um, had set his uncle up for this crime. One would think from an outsider looking in that if he had spent time planting blood, if he had spent time putting keys in trailers, if he had put the the rav back on the property, you would seize that opportunity to push your planting narrative to where it needed to be and focus on your uncle and only your uncle. When you sit there and you blame everyone, well, law enforcement over your uncle, that kind of goes against the whole framing scenario in a sense, unless you are really manipulative and you just are trying to throw in some really bizarre kind of, you know, tweaks in there to get everyone rattled like what to believe. But I just always found that interesting that if we're meant to believe that Bobby's planting all this stuff, yet he has an opportunity to drive that all home and make sure that the law enforcement doesn't look at him and only his uncle because he's gone through all this really hard work to make sure that it only points to his uncle and not him, but he doesn't take that opportunity. Um, and that that and you hear it again in 2017 interview. He he says it again. Do you think your brother, some t- your uncle, did it? Some days I do, sometimes I don't. None of some of the evidence still does doesn't make sense. So you know, it's little things like that that you know. I know that it's in a sense, and it's not trying to be disrespectful to Kathleen because that thought process goes against what she's trying to do. But it's a fair one to have because we're we're looking for the truth in a sense. And these are the things that we're left with is these details that we have to consider. This is what he said and how does it play into what we know. And I do believe that the reason why for in terms of a change of why the shower comes first or second is pivotal to law enforcement because they wanted that time to stretch out. They wanted it to appear she was there longer. And I think it all comes down to that phone call. They wanted that phone call at 2.41, that ping, to be where she's still on the Avery salvage yard. So that that was the connection they were really trying to make, that, that the last ping she had on the Avery salvage yard. So she, they needed that time to be longer. So they added five minutes on the clock with Bobby's shower going from before uh, to in the back. middle. Yeah, 100%, 100% correct. Um, because there's sort of like a, a, a cutoff time point at 2.41, I think, was the last time her phone had received any activity at 2.41. So they're desperate to ensure that Teresa Horbach uh, had never left the property. Yeah. Um, so that 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 is their narrative. When Detective O'Neill was speaking to Brendan Dassey at Crivets, isn't it remarkable that Brendan also said that the uh, car likely was planted by the cops? So interesting that both brothers had mentioned law enforcement as agents of planting. Isn't that remarkable? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I want to understand Cuss Road, and I want that narrative. It was actually a, a question that Susan brought up several weeks ago when we were talking about Cuss Road. Why didn't they just move everything over there and say, this, hey, this is Steve had it over here, and um, he brought everything over here to Cuss Road in this temporary burial spot? Um, but they didn't. What prevented that? And I, I, don't, I really can't answer. I don't know. 
It's one of my favorite questions, Jack, to be honest. I'm right there with you. That is uh, why, 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 why would that happen? Oh. Why, why not just take, why not just say, hey, the and this goes for a lot of different, you know, possibilities, not just Cuss Road, but a lot of different things could have been said. Oh, well, Stephen did it. And the fact is that we know that's how the court operates. If they were forced into it, they would say, oh, well, Stephen drove her 20 miles south and uh, that was part of the plan, right? They would incorporate it. But just quickly, that what you just said, Jeff, is exactly what the courts of appeal and Angela have done. They're, in terms of when they were ruling in their merit side of it, besides the procedurally bar that they kept slapping around, they kept saying that, well, it doesn't eliminate Stephen Avery. It doesn't eliminate Stephen Avery, whether the bones were A in A, B, C. There is, it doesn't mean that he didn't go do that. It doesn't mean he couldn't have done that. That is actually something they still go, that's their new go-to. And I know a lot of people get, you know, frustrated with that because that shouldn't be what, they're not the judge and jury and the, um, you know, in a trial here, they've just got a rule on like the, the law side of it, but it's like they're, they're creating their own narratives and we're, we're seeing it. It's definitely more complex, but in an overall view, it still doesn't eliminate Stephen Avery. And I know that sounds real asshole to say, but in hindsight, like in, in the totality of what the state, especially going off their reply, they, they really hinted at that going, okay, let's just entertain this for a moment that Bobby Dassey is involved. There is still no separation from Stephen Avery being the murderer and directing Bobby to do some of his dirty work. And they made a very interesting line in it by bringing Brendan into it because they state, just like how he recruited Brendan Dassey, pressure on Bobby is becoming more real. And yes, we have eyewitnesses that are saying that it's def like, not definitely, but it was Bobby Dassey that they believe that they identified. But it doesn't take Stephen out. You, there is no separation of them two. If anything, they literally are going to just go down the path is, okay, we missed one. We missed part of the narrative and Bobby's gotten away with it for a few years. But he, because at the end of the day, Bobby Dassey faced a real dilemma at the very beginning. It could have always been Bobby Dassey and Stephen Avery and Brendan yes. could have been left alone. Why didn't the state take the obvious and direct approach and make uh, Bobby Dassey as a co-conspirator from the get-go. Why not? I think it was easier. I think it was easier to get Bobby to just, Bobby, all we need you to do is say that you saw her walk that way and you left. And then now you're a great witness for us. I think it's easier. I, I think personally, so I think so too. And I, I, I personally think that, they probably would have went down that way if they even had a smidge of evidence, forensic evidence against him. Um, if And if he was like in the mindset like Brendan where he was weak, and I, and I apologize for using that word weak against Brendan, that's, it's cruel to say, but Brendan had a weaker mind because of weak his will. disability. Weaker will, yeah. Yeah, weaker will. And um, if Bobby had that intent as, intent as well to be on that weaker mindset, then he could have become just the Brendan Dassey in this scenario, but he was a lot stronger in his mindset and he was obviously more self-aware and he could see it. And I think that, um, and I, and I, in a sense, I don't even believe that originally that their whole idea for Brendan was to make him even a co-conspirator. I think they wanted him to be a witness for them, the main witness to say that he was watching his uncle act strange or was participating in a certain events in front of a fire, but eliminate him from the actual crime. But unfortunately, he fell down a rabbit hole of his own and he got caught up in the tangle of web. Yeah, I, I, I did. I did want to take a step back to what Kel was saying about the Court of Appeals because um, you know she, she's uh, read, read the text. Uh, we, we've read it on previous episodes, and she's one hundred percent correct about the types of things that the Court of Appeals asserts. But, but I, I just, I just can't let that go. Um, with, you know, with, without telling you how much I hate it, um, and that, that's that's because if you if you just think for a second. Let's assume for a second that um, Sawinski is 100% correct. Uh, and it was uh, Bobby Dassey pushing the rav along with some other uh, you know, ra ra random person. 
in, in, in my in my mind, that so distorts um, the, the the state's narrative that was used to convict both of them. That you know the, that that Stephen Avery uh, put her in the trailer and uh, you know you know murdered her, and all of a sudden you know on the on the night of November uh, or the morning of November fifth. Um, you know, so somebody's pushing the damn car onto the onto the salvage yard. That 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 so blows the state's narrative out of the water. That it, it it's it's hard to argue that the jury heard anything that's representative of the facts and the, and the, the actual facts, if Sawinski is to be believed, are so different. Um, wouldn't you think if this if this was you in this situation, right? You're you're wrongfully convicted. Not maybe not a murder. Maybe 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 of, maybe of something else. But a witness who actually saw something meaningful comes forward, and the, and the, just for the court of appeals to say, well, you know, that doesn't mean you, that doesn't mean you didn't do it. Um, yeah, sure, it's a great distortion of the of, of the narrative, but it doesn't prove you innocent. And that is the the fundamental fairness of that, um, not the legalness of it. I mean, because that you know, and Kathleen has we've heard her say in the previous episode um, that she does not prefer to go the federal route. Um, but think about the unfairness of how just a blowing the narrative out of the water doesn't lead you to the conclusion that the, ju that the jury really heard some evidence that was just fundamentally flawed um, and, uh, you know, warrant in and of itself, uh, you know, a, a, a new trial. It, it raises a lot of questions if the Sawinski affidavit is true. I just, it just, it bothers me a great, great deal that the that it's an option for the court of appeals to say, ah, eh, you know, it doesn't prove Avery innocent. It just it's it's just not comprehensible to me. And, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer. You get what you pay for. The uh, Jack and Jeff Law School, only one step above Marquette, as I've said before, um, is uh, you know, it just it just rubs me the wrong way. Back in the trailer. Bobby was probably only 30 seconds behind her. So we wanted to see how long it would take him to catch up with her if she was just driving normal speed and he was going over the speed limit. He catch her before they got to Q Road, and he did. And he could also see that she made a left turn. Right at 241, that's the last call where her cell phone is active. That call is right before she would have gotten to Cuss Road. She's distracted. She forwards the call and she pulls over. And that's where we think she stopped to talk, most likely to Bobby Dassey about doing a hustle shot. I think the point that Kathleen Zorn is trying to make is that would Teresa Horbuck have stopped for a random stranger as opposed to someone that she had just finished photographing his mother's vehicle? So in other words, Bobby Dassey, if it was Bobby Dassey, he had the perfect ruse uh, to stop Teresa Horbach. I think that that same scenario works for many other people, though. That's the problem is that we people who were regulars at the salvage yard knew that Teresa was the regular auto trader. That means it could have been Martinez. It could have been a host of other characters that we don't even know their names because they never came up on the radar. 
So that's where I am. I'm like, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Other Correct. people have also done. That's that's my only pushback on what you said. Agree. I, I, Agree. I agree, though, with Dr. Silkman, like it, it makes a lot of sense. But the issue that you have is, you know, he might have still been a stranger to her because we, we there's no clarification he, she's ever met Bobby or ever physically seen Bobby in any of her visits to the Avery Savage Yard. So this could have been, in her opinion, this just this random ass kid um, or a teenager or adult, depends on how she perceives how old he looked when he was flagging her down. Who is he? Until she stopped over, I get the whole what exactly what Dr. Silkman said and what Kathleen is trying to present here. It makes sense. Hey, address, unless she she didn't know who he was, and then when after he addresses himself, like, "Hey, I'm Bobby. I've just you just left my uncle's. I just saw you. I was trying to get you." And exactly how Dr. Silkman's and Kathleen's trying to play it out. It makes so much sense. The issue that I have is why would you now? Because we're about to watch it, but. Oh, but drive all the way down a road here right now in a cul-de-sac to take this picture when we are in an area that they could just pull a little bit more up to the left of the side of this grass field area and just take the photos here. This is where I think the reenactment starts getting a little bit, not awkward, but just hard to understand why this woman would then go, okay, we need to find a perfect spot. You don't need a perfect spot. You just need one picture of a vehicle and the details and that's it. You could do it on the side of the road. You don't have to drive an extra few minutes to get to another location to, to do the same thing in that locate in the same spot you you stopped at. Just like Kathleen right now, there is parts in this that I'm scratching my head going, this feels a little bit far fetched and I'm gonna be honest about it, but that's not her point. She can't she's not gonna be able to prove exactly what happened. No one knows what happened except the perp and the victim. No one's gonna be a hundred percent accurate exactly what happened. She's just trying to create a visual to basically show that in a time frame anything was possible and this could have been pulled off. And I respect that. So just like she's created a reenactment that does have a lot of flaws in it, it's just an overall view and exactly like you, Dr. Silkman, there could have been something that's been missed and this was part of the narrative, a true narrative, that she was always going to cuss road herself. And, you know, people can have double lives. People can have a private life. Uh, and if Teresa Horbach had made an agreement to have met up with somebody in that vicinity, you never something could have gone horribly wrong, uh, and uh, you know something took place at Cuss Road. Has anyone ever considered that? Hey, it wasn't Bobby Dassey that followed Teresa Horbach uh, to Cuss Road. She actually drove on her own volition to meet up with somebody. Who knows what put what brought her to that particular region? Can't forget. We don't have our text messages, so who knows? Right, uh, because uh, you know the the, the biggest uh, impediment until you do that further thinking to Dr. Silkman's narrative is that Teresa's uh, typical method of operation, and you see it on the thirty first, is to make sure that she makes contact with the people that she's going to go see on her business trips, well before she does it. Um, so uh, you know she taught she calls Avery, uh, she calls Schmitz. Um, and says, yeah, I'm going to be there around this time. She even calls people who, she's, who she doesn't think she's going to be able to make it to go see. Um, so, so, you know, uh, that, that, there is no documented call for, or uh, call in which we don't, we don't know that could possibly uh, send her over there. But as has been said, you know, this could have been prearranged, say, you know, uh, I, I prefer texts. Yeah, and we don't have, we don't have those texts. Um, you know, maybe it was, um, you know, the, a, a, diff a different phone. I strongly suspect that she did have uh, another phone because it's just incomprehensible to me um, that uh, she didn't get any phone calls from her friends during all this that was going on on, on, ha on Halloween. Um, just just not just doesn't not believable to me. So, yeah, uh, th that's it's it's possible from that perspective. And uh, that person you know, could have been a friend of hers for all we know. Um, or she could have been using another phone, or she could have used text. But uh, certainly it was her MO to call before um, and let that person know that she was going to be there at a certain time. So, um, 
what we don't, the, the stuff that we don't know um, that we should know is just horrific. If this is somebody you've had contact with, done a hustle shot with, they wave you down, you know, you're on Cuss Road. So why is Bobby Dassey lying? Why does Bobby Dassey have all of this deviant porn on his computer? Why are we able to recreate that and catch up with her in 30 seconds? Why do we end up right by Cuss Road where they suspect she was buried temporarily? Why is there blood on the rear cargo door if she wasn't ambushed? So those are just the normal questions that you would ask. Why didn't the state go with the narrative of her being attacked at Cuss Road? Because Forensically, there's nothing in Stephen Avery's trailer, right, guys? The CSI team went through. They couldn't find a damn thing. They even bought Brutus, the cadaver dog, inside Stephen Avery's master bedroom, and there was no hits. It was only hit inside his laundry bathroom area where he had dripped blood. So in actual fact, it's a much stronger narrative of Teresa Horbach being attacked outside the Avery salvage yard but for some unknown reason, the state never went with that narrative, right? And then, of course, when you enter in Brendan Dassey, who provided that narrative false, as it turned out, and impossible to believe, the state then stuck with the narrative of Teresa Horbach being attacked inside Stephen Avery's trailer. Well, well to, to me, it's a better story um, for a jury that, um, you know, the, the crime and the crime scene is consolidated within, you know, a few hundred square feet, you know, um, <laughs> maybe square yards. Uh, I, th I think that's the better story for the jury to hear. Um, and it's easy to sit back and critique the state's choice of, of story. But uh, as we sit here, uh, Stephen and Brendan are, are still in prison and have been there for many, many years. So uh, I think they did a pretty good job on their narrative. They pulled out all the stops, including uh, pizza to the jury uh, in one of the in one of the trials. Um, so uh, I, 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 I'm not going to sit here and criticize the uh, the efficacy of the state's argument or the way they chose to frame the evidence because it's pretty obvious that they that they did what they set out to do, which was uh, stop the depositions and put Avery away for a while. Yeah, it, it's interesting to add to what Doc's saying. They, they didn't really have uh, anything inside the trailer. They, there was no interest in the burn pit on the 7th. And then all of a sudden, on the November 8th, we have rain day. It's, it's Mingo Bob. Everything just manna from heaven, right? So... Um, I just wanted to also address, like, the... Uh final word on uh, Kathleen um, you know we, we got a portion of the reenactment but um, if anyone's interested the full reenactment which uh, people have were able to obtain and they've put it on YouTube um, it kind of has a little bit more detail it goes beyond the cuss road and you know what she implies could have happened um, in, in duration I think it narrows down to like 12 minutes in 12 minutes um, the whole purpose of the reenactment was to be able to show that uh, Bobby Dassey absolutely could have um, committed a crime um, in in the details and the time frame that Kathleen's going on. Uh, that, in in summary, that I think that was just the proje projection and the whole point and narrative that Kathleen's just trying to show everyone that it's absolutely possible. In twelve minutes, the crime could have been. Um, started to, to the end uh, the issue I have with this and it is absolutely the devil's advocate comment what I'm about to make next um, what's not favorable about it is it's a risk factor on Kathleen in a sense because she was able to prove that well demonstrate that if Bobby Dassey could pull it off in 12 minutes the state could easily say your reenactment showed that your your Denny can do it in 12 minutes 
your client could have also done it in 12 minutes. The same rule applies of time. So, you know what I mean? So, and I know that's something that I'm, I'm bringing that up because we address it a lot because we always say, Stephen, didn't, where's the time that this, this, this happened? There's people always coming and going and there's these um, Mars coming down with the mail. There's Chuck and there's Earl and there's Fabian coming up and there's Brendan comes home and Blaine comes home and Barb comes home. So where's the time? But then, in a sense, Kathleen has provided a time to say that it can be done all in 12 minutes regardless so as as an advantage as it is to what she's trying to provide in terms of a denny it also can have a ripple effect on her client because the same rules can apply to him and again it's the word elimination it doesn't eliminate him and the state had a narrative to pursue if they wanted to of stephen following her and killing her off the property but they never went with that narrative. And the question must be asked, why didn't they do it? To me, the take-home message is this. Um, she used Bobby um, as potentially committing this horrendous crime. I don't know whether she believes it or not, but I believe that what Kathleen Zellner eloquently showed is that the murder could have taken place, or the ambush of Teresa Horbart took place not on the property, but off the property. That's the take-home message I, I get here. And what must be asked is, why didn't the state pursue it? Because you know what? Their case would have been stronger, in my opinion, against Stephen by saying, hey, look, we've got forensic evidence that shows blah, 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 blah. They never went with that. They went with, okay, we can't prove it, but we're going to plant all the forensic evidence on the property to point to Stephen. And that's why I always go back about the finding of the RAV4. That is crucial. Notice where the RAV4 was found, not off the property, but on the property, which set off the domino effect. So, you know, it's um, a very interesting situation. Thank you. It's, uh, I also want to add um, to this whole Cuss Road thing. If you read the unfiled warrant, if you read number 11 in Wigard's search warrant affidavit, it specifically states in there that, I think it's number 11, it may be one of the others. Let me retract that. But regardless, it does say that the cadaver dog hit on this disturbed earth, indicating that either blood or, or a cadaver had been, or a dead person, oh, somebody dead, oh, yep, had been in that state. And that disturbed earth uh, location. Where did he get that from? I tend to agree with Big Joe. I, I think for tidiness uh, for a, a jury, you know, maybe even a more, I'm not saying these people are dumb or anything in that area, but to sim simplify it for the jury, make it easy for them to uh, wrap their heads around this horrible, you know, situation, horrible murder. It happened on the property. The problem, though, is the process of everything that we know now. Uh, and, and how things were found, how they were handled, how they weren't handled. Um, but I can't get around Susan's question. I can't. It's it's po it's, it's point on. Anyway, thank you. Um, I guess that brings us to the time of the show where we uh, headed over to Big Jeff for Jeff, Big Jeff for wrap up comments. The last major filing right now. Forget about the amended filing, right? After the Court of Appeals was the Sawinski filing. And that filing, in my mind, might as well have the subheading Bobby the Denny. And, uh, you know, she, Kat, Kathleen, articulated her recipe for Stephen a Avery's exoneration early in MAM 2. And step one in her narrative was demonstrate that Stephen's constitutional rights have been violated. Uh, and that was the the most, the fastest and most credible route to a new trial. And right now with the, um, you know, with many of the issues that we've seen in MAM2 being overturned or, you know, some of them procedurally barred, uh, you know, and others ruled unfavorably, what she has right now as, as at her best 
chance of this demonstration of the constitutional rights violation uh, is the um, the Denny uh, the, the Denny violation. Denny violation meaning that in the United States of America, you need to be allowed to name a suspect who who meets uh, certain thresholds of um, you know of, of involvement in the uh, in, in the crime. Uh, we loosely say means, motive, and opportunity. We've been through it before. No need to rehash it. Um, but this uh, you know this um, video that uh, that Kathleen created was in itself as much of an experiment as it was a you know beginning of her framing the Denny narrative against Bobby. And that was, you know, is it possible, as Dr. Silpham was saying early in the episode, is it possible that he could have left, could have caught up and, and could have and, and could have done this? Uh, and the answer was not only yeah, but it's, you know, he caught up to her in 30 seconds and that wasn't really a, a, a problem. Now is that I'm agreeing that that's how it happened? No. Um, but certainly that's part of uh, Kathleen Zelma's original framing of the, uh, the narrative. I don't know whether Bobby Dassey did this or not. Um, certainly the, uh, uh, the hope of Kathleen is that her continued investigation is going to be able to demonstrate that Bobby does meet the three prongs of Denny, irrespective of whether he did it or not. I don't believe that Bobby is any, in any uh, hot water or not, because if he, even if the, you know, uh, he does rise to the level of, of Denny in the eyes of some court. Um, he's not going to jail for this. There's not enough. There's not enough evidence to convict Bobby. So Bobby actually has nothing to worry about other than the discomfort of having potentially to get another uh, interview like he got in 2017. Um, and that's it, that's an actual fact why the prongs of Denny are so hard to meet, right? Because you can't just say anybody and, you know, and get it and get a jury verdict thrown out. Um, so I think, I think that's where we're at. The video is interesting, thought provoking. You, 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 you have to watch it with a, with a trained eye and you really have to be not afraid uh, to discuss it among friends and point out the things that are consistent, that are inconsistent, um, that you, that you like about it, that you don't like about it. Uh, and continue to, to dig further because uh, that's that that's where the truth is. It, I, the truth might be so deeply buried that we'll never get it out, which is what what I fear. But uh, we're not going to not get it out. Um, but I'm not going to not get it out. We're, we won't we won't get it out unless we keep on digging and finding the flaws in people's narratives or continuing to correlate. Uh, know the evidence that we know against other truths that we know from other places so that was a long summary and may maybe i missed the mark for what we really talked about but um, that's how this episode strikes me well not at all big jeff uh, in fact i i think there's only one person to throw it to from here and that's dr silverman because i don't know if you agree with me or not dr silverman but i think that was one of the best summations that we've heard of all time so i'll throw it over to you dr silverman thank you again um, and yeah, look, it really was a fascinating episode. And personally, I blame the state for putting Bobby Dassey in the situation that he's in. I believe that if the detectives and investigators had just done a little bit of research right back in 2005, a lot of these issues could have been resolved. And, uh, you know, as a consequence of this, the real killer and killers are still at large. And we've got two innocent people in prison for life, for something that they haven't done, couldn't have committed. And the forensic evidence does not indicate that Teresa Orbach was assaulted or murdered on the Avery Salvage Yard. The evidence tends to suggest that she was attacked outside the Salvage Yard. The question must be asked, why did the state never pursue that avenue? Well, thank you for sure, Dr. Silkman. And uh, we'll throw it over to Jack. Jack, if you wouldn't give us your summation and... Uh... Uh, for today. Thank you. Yeah, just a couple of uh, things to add in to um, just really brilliant uh, summation and, and, and what Dr. Sutman said. You know, you think about, uh, I think about what these goals of, the, of these police officers and especially the prosecutor, because uh, they were heavily involved up, up to their damn eyeballs. And you can't tell me they weren't. Four, four of them, DAs and ADAs show up on the the fifth after the within you know four three four hours five hours whatever it was but the time the rab was found so i have to ask what what was their goal what was being said basically off off camera in private what were the discussions and don't tell me they didn't have any that's a lie they had many so 
I think that you you had elements, uh, you know, you had the, the the Poggles and Petersons and Kratz and whoever, you know, they're they're saying this this and this and this they want, and then you have another element uh, within the 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 police itself that's trying to help the case, despite whatever else is being said, they just want to help the case. I'm not saying that they're terrible people, from a, a cop standpoint, yeah, it's it's really terrible. But you know, they're they're trying to uh, I guess go into protection mode. That's that. So I, I think it's a it's a really good point as uh, to what Doc said. This forensic stuff and, and all this other stuff it, it, it really gets really messy. It, it's it's a disaster really in many ways. And then um, you know I, I want to talk just briefly about um, uh, what our our I guess the law uh, in as it, we talk about Denny. And the onus being on the defendant, not the state. The defendant has to prove motive if he wants to bring it to any suspect. And I, to me, this almost it, it's not the same as uh, the en banc, but uh, you know we just that that was part of the discussion uh, that we've had recently, and I, I feel so strongly. To me, the en banc really all br almost brushes hard, really, up against uh, double jeopardy because. Brendan's situation had already been decided twice. But we're not done, guys. We need to rehash and relitigate this shit again. I'm asking for an on mock, and he gets it granted. You know, I'm sorry I threw that in. It was just in my mind, and I wanted to get it out there. Anyway, um, this was a really uh, great discussion. I didn't add too much. You guys did such an excellent job. I didn't really need to. So thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, hard to uh, disagree with those comments. And uh, Cal, if you wouldn't uh, give us your wrap up for the end of episode 42. Yeah, sure. Um, you definitely give me the hardest job because how the hell can you finish off after hearing everyone's wrap ups? It's, it's almost impossible to even come close to anything that gets said. Um, brilliant wrap ups. I'm not going to touch base on any of that because it was all already done. Um, in terms of the uh, whole reenactment, I just want to, you know, clarify from my point of view. When I made some comments in regards to, you know, the reenactment and some of them not being favourable to Kathleen's stance, again, I just want to highlight and I and don't mean to speak on behalf of the panel here, but I'm pretty sure we're all in agreement. We don't mean to disrespect her or go against her. That is not what we're doing. We're just having an open discussion. And Jeff, uh, sorry, Big Jeff said in his opening statement, like closing statement, my apology, that, you know, we're, we're having a discussion amongst friends and the community members and things that we don't like and things that do make points. And that's part of what a discussion is about. It's bringing balance, diversity, thoughts, opinions, and we're just bringing that forward. So, you know, although there was parts of it that I might have, you might feel that I nitpicked a little bit too much, and I, but I'm only trying to bring forward facts. The, nothing I said was, you know, in terms of timelines, it's just my opinion. These are facts. These are all in the records, and I'm just bringing things in because it's something that we have to review. Uh, in saying that, you know, the whole motive of why Kathleen did the reenactment, which I've already said, and it's the last repeat, I promise, is just to show an alternative scenario. And if you put it into a visual effect, it helps people understand it and make sense of it. And she was able to do that in 12 minutes. Does it take it away? Is is the takeaway showing that Bobby Dassey is the killer? No, absolutely not. And that's, you know, she's just trying to show that it's possible. Um, and I and I have to respect her for that as well. That is that is her job. And that is what, you know, Jay Jax just said. It's actually the Denny constitutional right. It falls on the defence team. It's their burden to be able to tick off all those markers. And if they don't reach the, the, the bar of those three prongs, it gets dropped. Uh when I've looked, and I and you all know, and as frustrating as it is for people, I have reread the courts of appeal, you know, 
um, decision from 2021 over and over again because I wanted a baseline to their understanding on the case and where they're coming in from it. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, that they've got they've got their their reviews on how they are trying to structure what their belief is in a sense, which doesn't appear fair. And I think we've already hit that, but it is what it is. And the state now, when you I just reread the state reply again in terms of this motion, because this is where we're at. Everything now is a little bit moot in terms of moot stage because it's all been heard, seen, procedurally barred, and it's kind of been pushed to the side. So where we're at now is Denny and the Brady of Tom Skowinski's phone call and the witness side of it. Now, the state, um, in their reply to Kathleen, I want to highlight that it appears, in my opinion, after rereading it, I know there's the standard of Denny, which is your three prongs, your motive, your opportunity, and direct connection. But it almost feels like they have created in their reasoning of why they don't believe that Kathleen has met her burden is they've added another aspect to it. And that's the the framing side of it. So when I reread it, it took me a little while to get it, um, get it through my own head here to understand it. But, you know, the motive side is, you know, Kathleen's trying to bring in the DASI computer content. And I think that's a fair assumption because I, I, I will say to the community, I am getting quite frustrated in hearing people reference it as Bobby Dassey's computer. This was not Bobby Dassey's computer. Saying that is no better than the state saying that it was Bren, Brennan Dassey's computer. It was stated and marked as the Dassey computer. Everyone used it, whether it was for other reasons than the other they all used it. It was bought for the boys for originally for their homework. And I think that it should be addressed as a DASI computer. That's just a little little tweak that I get real a bit frustrated with when people like to start to say Bobby. I think that's really unfair to the case. And it's a certain detail that does is just cruel to the whole, you know, the truth. Um, but going back to what I was saying is the motive side, she's trying to introduce the DASI computer content to make it like a sexual element to the case. Makes sense. I'm not going to dispute that. But the state are now saying, okay, if you've got that, you also have to show us a motive to why Bobby wanted to frame Stephen. And then it follows suit with the opportunity. They're saying, okay, he might have had the opportunity to commit the crime because he knew she was there. He was in the proximity at the time. But we've now made a new burden and that burden is, and it's, it's, in, it's in print, they say, Where's the opportunity that he framed um, Stephen with all the skills and the tools and all the uh, requirements and foreknowledge he would have needed? So although in hindsight the, the Denny argument is should be as quick and clean to hit all those points, it really does feel like the state's trying to tell the judge that the, the burden of them are higher now because you have to consider that this is not just a suspect, it's a suspect who also apparently framed Stephen. So great, great episode. I'm so glad we were all here. Uh, this is what we're here for. Thank you to everyone in the chat. Thank you to the panel for always, you know, bringing all, all the knowledge in the years of, you know, we've been on the case and, Thank you so much for hosting, as always, Jeff Jones. Well, thank you, Kel, and thanks for those comments. Uh, a big special thank you to all you guys on the panel, Jack and Big Jeff, Kelly and Dr. Silkman. Um, I, I don't want to just repeat everything you said. I couldn't do it if I tried. Um, I just want to resonate a few points that I appreciate you guys coming along for the ride with us. I appreciate all the comments when you could be here on the panel. Appreciate you guys in the big chat. Uh, in the in the group chat and uh, by the time you guys hear this episode the channel will have crossed a thousand subscribers so i do want to say thank you so much to everybody out there who's been there from the beginning has got us to the thousand mark so that's our own little celebration for this episode cherry on top thank you very much so for big jeff 
Kel, Dr. Silkman, and Jack. This is Jeff Jones saying this has been discussing a murderer. <laughs>